Bom dia. Bom dia. It is amazingly great to be back in Brazil. It has been 11 years for me. Um, I, um, I was listening to Fabio talk, you know, I didn't have the translator, but I heard Campinas and Porto Alegre and all the other places that we've been. Uh, I don't know why it's been so long, but I know there's been some struggles here, but it's wonderful to see everyone back. It's a lot of energy. Uh, I will admit, I, I went on a diet before I came to Brazil, so I was ready. Uh, because I expected some amazing food and I have not been disappointed. So, um, it, I know the pandemic's been hard for everyone. Uh, I've just started traveling. Uh, but I started last year in September. Uh, this is um, my seventh trip or eighth or tenth trip. And I have about 50 travel days left in the year. So, Uh, things are getting very busy. We have a conference in Israel coming up. We have one in Berlin. We have a conference in Armenia. We have one in Japan. Uh, we're trying to do one in perhaps Singapore. So uh, a lot of excitement around Postgres, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is a very unusual talk. Uh, it is really a talk that leaders give because leaders are always trying to understand where the risks are in their organizations. And I go to a lot of leadership training uh, so that I'm effective. And uh, this talk is about what challenges we have in Postgres going forward. Now, the good thing is I have an hour to speak, so we'll have a good amount of time for questions. I know a lot of people have some very hard, difficult, difficult questions for me, I am sure. Um, thank you. As we go forward, So um, let's, uh, let's get started. My name is Bruce Momjan. I am from Philadelphia. I do work for uh, EDB. And uh, the slides you're going to be seeing are one of a set of 58 slides that are available at that URL. Uh, there are 106 videos, presentations, and 650 blog entries. So uh, there's a lot of material there if you're curious. Uh, please, uh, please feel free to, to go there and uh, be, perhaps you might get stuck there too long uh, looking at those those things. Um, but again, this talk is, I think, a great talk because challenges is something we've had to deal with for the past two years. And I know even before then, Brazil has had challenges to restructure uh, its open source efforts uh, after the government stop supporting open source in the same way. And then obviously there's been economic challenges in Brazil and, and all of Latin America, even before COVID and even during COVID. Uh, but the great thing about, I think, Postgres is that we're a community, we're together. Uh, I was invited to come to this conference in December, like so nine months ago. Very rarely do I get a nine month lead time. Um, but it shows how strong the community is and how much desire there is to get together. Uh, and I think that you will find that Postgres community has a lot of strengths. There's a lot of sort of uh, coming together and energy around the project. And I'll be talking about some of that today. Uh, but I'm also going to be talking about some of the challenges, the challenges that we have to open source. I've been involved with Postgres since 1996, which what is that, 26 years now that I've been, I've been doing this. Um, I've seen a lot of changes. One of the questions I got yesterday was, did you have any idea when you started in 1996 that we would be where we are today with Postgres? And of course, I have no idea. Um, well, you know, it's funny, you know, when you graduate from college or high school, you know that's a special day. When you get married, you know that's a special day. When you get involved with Postgres, you don't know that's a special day. It's just a day. Uh, and a day becomes a year, and a year becomes a decade. And 26 later, years later, you're still doing the same thing. Um, I had no idea that the database industry would be so critical at, and it would grow so much. I had no understanding that Postgres would actually start to eclipse or, or overshadow the big database players that we had, um, uh, like you know, 
all these billion dollar companies now are promoting Postgres because they know that Postgres in a lot of ways is the, is the future. Uh, similar to the way Linux has eclipsed proprietary operating systems, we have basically uh, Postgres eclipsing those. And that's just going to continue. I mean, you see it every year I get new crazy things that happen. I'm not even going to mention the one I've heard in the past year, but a company that is probably one of the biggest database companies may come up with its own version of Postgres. Like, what? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but there's a lot of things that don't make any sense. The fact that I'm here doesn't make any sense. The fact that we've got so many people here, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but there's something special about what we're doing, and I think that's uh, what we're seeing here. So um, what am I going to talk about? The first thing I'm going to talk about is where is Postgres today? And that's a very positive part because there are some very interesting statistics here uh, that talk about where we are as a project, where we are in terms of adoption, uh, where we've seen sort of the trajectory of Postgres go. But then I'm going to talk about three areas of challenge. Now, the good news from the start is that none of these areas are really a problem right now. I'm not going to come out and say, oh, we've got a problem right here. What I am going to say is that these are potential problems that we eventually may have. So as leadership, we basically look and we sort of try and identify, are these going to be, are these getting bigger? Is there an area we need to take action on and so forth? Because if you're 26 years in, you may be doing it for another 26 years. So you want to make sure that the people who are relying on the software have leadership that is looking to, to make sure that any risks that you have around the project are managed responsibly, right? You don't want to just blindly go in without looking. Uh, the second area are competitive challenges. These are challenges to our market, challenges to the, to the space of relational database in general. And then third, um, I'm going to talk about technical challenges. And these are areas where the technology might change in a way that we don't understand. And again, I'm going to have time for questions so we can actually, you know, sort of, you can ask things and we can, we can have an interactive part here. Okay. So um, actually, I'm going to go right away. Any questions so far? No. Good. Okay, great. All right. Um, so current challenges. What are the current challenges uh, technically we see with Postgres? Um, the good, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. What's the current status? I'm, I'm sorry. What's the current status? So 35 years of development. This goes all the way back to the Berkeley years, 1986. Um, so that's, you know, what is that, 36 years. 10 years of work, it had development in the, in the university. I started in 96, so we've had 25 plus years of annual major releases where we've been releasing um, every year uh, in a reliable way. Uh, we have 180 features roughly per release. Postgres 15, which is coming out, I believe, next month, has around that number, right? 174, 176, something like that. Um, and we continue to put out regular quarterly minor releases, okay, um, which obviously are important so people know that they're getting their releases. Okay. Uh, BSD license, uh, there are, there have been continual changes in the industry, particularly by companies like Mongo or, or um, Elasticsearch that are changing licenses to try and monetize the software they control. The beautiful part of Postgres is nobody controls it. Maybe that's good and bad, uh, but there's clearly no company that controls what's going on. Uh, there's companies that might like to, but they also realize that's probably not a good thing, and then they, they, they have no real desire to do it, nor have an ability to do it. So <laughs> in both areas, we're, we're safe there from the kind of changes that we've seen in licensing uh, by companies that control the, the open source software. I can go into that if there's a QA and a about that later. Um, the development and the leadership is diversified. We have a geographic spread, cultural spread, and of course, multi-company. Um, we, you know, we continue to to try and bring in new companies and also to spread the number of companies that are kind of involved and new people involved in the project. This is a great graph. I'm sorry if it's not super like uh, a high resolution, but. What it's showing you is a pie chart that was done for Postgres 14, I believe, uh, 13, I'm sorry, uh, showing all the companies that contributed to the, the feature set of Postgres 13. Now, this is obviously changed from 14 to 15, 
Um, I remember giving a talk in Japan, and I could highlight all of the Japanese companies that were involved, right? If I'm in, if I'm in Europe, I can highlight all of the, of the um, European companies. Uh, I don't know, does anybody see Latin America based companies here? I don't, I, I don't see any. Mongo is kind of surprising. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, um, yeah, I don't. So we have some Russian ones, and we have some, you know, people from Asia. Um, Japan, uh, China's sort of grown a little bit. We, we would see some changes if we looked at Postgres 15. We'd see a couple more China uh, contributions. So again, this is a fluid thing. That's the that's really the important part. It's not the question of who has more or which ones are there. The point is, it's a fluid thing. It's going up and down all the time. Um, we don't really control what's going on. It's just this fluid thing moving around. Um, and that's when you're strong. When you have one company dominating things, whatever, then you, you start to have problems. Or one geography or one uh, sort of workload. Uh, this is a great slide. I, I It was done 2013. I'm still using it. <laughs> the, the, the real unusual part about this slide is that most people, when they think of software, think of it improving, think of it as improving in one direction at a time. So you think, okay, this is the cloud release of the software. This is the performance release. This is when they add feature X. This is when they, you know, redo the, the, the user interface, whatever. What's weird about Postgres is you have these changes happening at the same time, all the time. <laughs> you don't have, because you don't have a central structure controlling what's happening, you don't have a single like director, and therefore it is this amalgamation of people and companies and volunteers all working together. Some of them working on enterprise features, some of them working on developer features, some of them improving usability, some of them improving performance, some of them working on the cloud, some of them going on completely tan different tangents. So I just think it's great if you look at any release of Postgres, you'll see it improving kind of that way, this way, uh, all the time. And uh, it's a little odd, um, but I think it's been healthy for us. And it's what enables us to continue to innovate because we can copy what other relational systems do, but where we really excel is innovation. Um, and you probably have seen that in if you've used Postgres at all. Uh, this is another um, interesting slide talking about the popularity of Postgres. Again, uh, this is from 2020, so this is increased still. I don't even need to look, I know it's increased. Uh, but again, you see increased um, interest in Postgres and excitement around Postgres. Any questions about that? Okay, great. So that's that's kind of the that's kind of the good news. It's how strong we are. It's our ability to really, uh, you know, it's. I don't know. If somebody asked me, you know, did you have some kind of plan, or your core team had a plan, or community had a plan? We don't have any plan. Uh, I know that sounds really unnerving and people who want a roadmap and want to know where we're going. We have a lot of individuals who all have individual plans. <laughs> and you, to get something done, you have to work together to get other people excited about your plan. You have to sell it. You have to show the value of it. And then you get excitement around it and eventually you do it. Um, but you don't get, there is not a plan. There's a whole bunch of different plans, a whole bunch of different people all working at the same time. It's true in all the open source projects, I would say, uh, and it's pretty powerful. So let's take a look at the challenges to the project itself. Um, first one is leadership disruption, and this is a, kind of an interesting thing. I've been, you know, I've been around open source since 1991, so a long time, uh, and I've seen good open source leadership and I've seen bad open source leadership. Um, one of the cases actually uh, with GIMP, if you're familiar with the GNU image processing something, whatever that stands for, um, it was actually abandoned uh, in the early 2000s uh, because the community who was developing it, I guess, didn't see a future for it. It just stopped. And fortunately, another group came in and 
continued with it, and now we have GIMP, right? Uh, the same thing actually happened to Postgres in 96. The university stopped working on it, and then we started in 96, or it stopped about 95. In 96, we came along, a bunch of people, not just me, and said, you know, there's a lot of potential here, probably the way the GIMP people did in the early 2000s. Let's see if we can make something out of this. And 26 later, years later, here we are, okay? Um, another leadership issue which I actually take pretty seriously is the, the Red Hat CentOS case. I'm not sure how many of you actually understand what happened there, but it's my understanding that CentOS years ago was having problems with funding, problems with infrastructure, problems with leadership. They invited Red Hat staff in to help them, and in the recent years, Red Hat decided to effectively take the project in a, a direction that did really not match the, the former leaders nor the majority of users of CentOS. Um, so that is a cautionary tale, I would say. Um, <laughs> if you want to if you want to dig it up, it's a pretty ugly case. Uh, it almost sounds like a Shakespeare play, but um, effectively in that case, the leadership, I would say, lost control <clears throat> of the software and the ownership, particularly the rights to the name and the infrastructure that distributed it, and a company gained control of it, and then I would say leveraged it in a way that was harmful to the majority of users. I, I, I don't say that lightly, um, but that's my analysis of, of what's going on. If somebody has a different take on that, I'd, I'd be interested to hear it. Uh, you do see new projects starting up, Rocky Linux being the most familiar one, that's trying to take the original CentOS ethos and approach and create a new open source alternative for that, okay? Indicating that the old, the current CentOS is not, is no longer really has the same focus. Um, I, it's a pretty nasty case. I, I did ask a Red Hat employee once about a couple of days ago, and they said, I, I'd rather not, uh, they just had this really anguished look on their face and said, I'd rather not talk about it. So uh, it's, I think it's somewhat of an embarrassment. Um, so that's a, for me, that's a cautionary tale that the leadership has got to remain independent of any company. It's got to remain focused on what the user community wants, not what any individual company might want to do with the software which I'm afraid is what happened in the CentOS case. Um, poor reputation is a serious concern for us. It's, it's more of a concern for a database, I'd say, than other pieces of software. You know, if your game crashes, well, yeah, you're upset, but it's not, it's not the same, okay? Uh, if your database corrupts your data, that's a big problem. Uh, if your database crashes, that's a big problem. So um, in a way, the database has a very high bar for reliability. And there have been databases that have suffered from this. The only the example I can think of most clearly is uh, Innerbase, which is now Firebird database. And when it became Firebird, they worked, this is in the early 2000s, they worked on the source code. It was out of Borland. I'm not, how many, anybody remember the Interbase or this? Yeah, okay, so be a problem, okay. Uh, right, so what happened was they were, they were at, in the early 2000s, there was Postgres and then there was Firebird. And we were kind of the two open source relational databases out there. Yeah, MySQL was over here, but it was controlled by a company. It wasn't quite the same. Um, but what happened was the Firebird source code had a hard-coded password in the source code that came from Borland. And the tragedy for them is that it was not identified until about a year and a half after they had been releasing the code. So it undermined, because there was this hard-coded password in there for whatever reason, it undermined the, the, the confidence people had in the source code. Is that a great indication that it was a serious problem? I don't know, I, I don't know. I can admit that there were parts of the Postgres source code I didn't understand when I started and probably still don't. But uh, I will say that, that it's something like that that can be very serious because your reputation is, particularly for database, is, is very important. Um, if you have security flaws, obviously we try and manage those as well as we can. We're not perfect, uh, but we do our best. Buggy releases, 
That would that can be a problem. I used to use Informix. Informix version six was so buggy that um, Inform Informix told people go back to Informix five. And then any Informix folks here? <clears throat> One okay. Uh, and then when Informix seven came out, it was it was so buggy that you you had a couple bugs. You reported them. They got fixed in the next release, which took six months or a year, but then you had two more bugs that you didn't know about. And then that would cycle through, and eventually you're, you're basically like, I've worked around the bugs I know about, why am I gonna bring in a new release that's gonna bring me new bugs I don't know about that could be more serious? And after a while you stop upgrading, and when people stop upgrading, the software is done. Um, so again, I, I, I get maybe I've been around long enough to see what can happen badly, uh, so I, I try, we try and stay away from that. Um, I, I'm a small part of it. We have a huge team who is incredibly dedicated to that, uh, but they have the right mindset, and that's, I think, the most important thing. Uh, instability, poor performance, data corruption, again, serious, could tremendously damage the project. Um, but the good news is we have not had those cases, and hopefully we will not in the future. Um, patent attacks, this one, um, th when I, when I, this is sort of the monster in the room that, that a lot of people don't talk about, at least in the United States. Maybe it's not an issue here, but the whole uh, legal framework around patents and what can be enforced and what's patentable in software has been this sort of uncertain thing for decades. And companies continue releasing software and continue developing, but companies sort of show up from the woodwork doing crazy stuff and almost unpredictably and almost indefensibly. You almost don't know how, where the possible attack would come from. Uh, so I think it's a terrible situation. Almost everyone agrees with that. It's probably not as bad here, but United States, it's, it's just this black cloud. Um, so if I'm looking at risks, patent attack, Black cloud to me. Let me give you some examples. Um, Rambus was a was a, a patent holder related to um, chips, uh, inter circuit chips, particularly memory chips. Uh, they had a patent on a certain type of RAM. I believe it was DDR3 or DDR2. Uh, but they did not. They were part of a standards organization, and they didn't tell the standards organization when they suggested this method that they owned the patent on it. And the patent, the, the standard organization standardized on it, and then they then went to try and enforce their patents on everyone who had adopted this standard. Pretty nasty story. Um, that was, this is years ago, so it's not, this is not a recent thing, but, but if you want to talk weird patent stories, that's a good one. Uh, we could have competitors attack us with patents. Microsoft, who, who now supports Postgres very strongly. We have a core team member there and a bunch of other very senior developers over at Microsoft. But back in when back years ago, back in the early, you know, the, the 1990s, 2000s, Microsoft was trying to um, enforce patents on their file system. So because B B Linux could read and write the Windows file system. Uh, they were attempting to basically either prevent that or for some kind of licensing on that. Uh, pretty nasty. I never really went a whole where, but it was this black cloud uh, that kind of hung over, particularly Windows compatibility at the file system level uh, for quite a while. I told you that the patent stuff can be really uh, random. Uh, patent trolls, if you've ever heard that term before, uh, they patent things like sending faxes for weird things and image form and they just try and they just try and sue everybody and see who sends them money. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it happens all the time. And it's just again, black cloud, I haven't had an issue, but if I'm looking at risks, I got I gotta think about that one. Uh, we have two good news. Uh, there's something called the Open Invention Network. It's a bunch of companies, including Oracle, and I believe Microsoft and Oracle, which is kind of interesting, who have agreed to give their patents to open source projects for free. So that gives us somewhat of an umbrella over uh, patent attacks, and, and we're really excited about that. IBM, I think, is also part of that. So they're huge patent holders. That kind of makes me a little more confident. Um, I don't know if that 
protection extends beyond open source releases of Postgres. So proprietary, I, I don't know. Uh, but that's just kind of interesting. And then there's also called Unified Patents, which is a new project trying to sort of get some sanity around patents for software. I know you didn't come to hear about patents and software, but it is this black cloud that as a leader I have to think about. Uh, identity challenges, uh, obviously I remember I talked about CentOS and sort of losing their trademark or losing control of their uh, ma uh, leadership. We have obviously to make sure that the Postgres trademark remains, um, remains uh, uh, secure. Uh, we do have a nonprofit out of Canada which holds uh, the rights to that. Uh, we do have some ongoing issues with people registering things that we that the community isn't isn't happy about. Uh, I assume those will be will be dealt with. But uh, the point is that we continue to make sure that the name Postgres and, and the trademark uh, is is secure uh, as best we can do it. Um, it's because obviously people rely on that. Uh, another another interesting case, and I, I, I used to be asked about this more years ago. In fact, I have two blog entries about this particular topic. Uh, but how is cloud going to impact open source, right? We've, it's kind of this big thing. There's these billion, billion dollar companies coming in using open source. I mentioned Elasticsearch and have, and, and you might remember that or, that. AWS has a, a, a custom version of Elasticsearch to bypass the license change that Elasticsearch made. Uh, they've, they're, 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 they're sort of going back and forth on how to deal with Mongo's licensing. Um, so these are, you know, these are obviously humongous companies. How do they impact open source? Do they propel open source? Do they limit open source? And I think I, I think it's a mixed it's a mixed case. Um, in a lot of ways, the cloud vendors are using open source to upsell, to, to have additional <clears throat> services that they can give and generate revenue. Uh, that's always good, I think. Um, they already have the relationship with the customer, so the idea of having an RDS part of the infrastructure you're already buying makes sense. Um, but there are cases, particularly with company-controlled open source, uh, where you get impacted uh, by the changes of license and so forth. Another, another case that I, I kind of mentioned here is what happens if the cloud use of your software becomes so big that it eclipses the open source project, right? Because a lot of people who are getting Postgres, they're getting it from either our website or they're getting the source code or they're probably getting it from Red Hat or the package managers or Debian or, or, or Ubuntu or wherever they're getting their Postgres. Okay, they know it's Postgres, right? And there, the, the, there's two risks. One, they start to associate Postgres so much with the cloud vendor, they don't realize there's an open source thing out there. Okay, um, and another potential case, which I've not seen, is actually using the source code and not naming it Postgres, right? And then people are using the source code, but you're not, they're not even clear there is a project out there because there's no name associated with it. Um, I've not seen that too much with Postgres. Postgres is so big that people want to name their products Postgres because they, they think that's a plus. Uh, but you can imagine a case where somebody would take source code, rename it, use it, and become so big and the, uh, the open source project starves because they don't, people don't even know we're around. The good news I've seen is that it appears as though Cloud vendors are increasingly getting involved in the open source community. They're sort of educated and starting to see the value of open source involvement more than just taking the source code, actually being involved with the project. And I, I think that's a positive thing. And hopefully other companies, I know AWS has made some improvements. I'd like to see Google there. Um, Alibaba is struggling to do that. Um, uh, Microsoft obviously is already heavily involved, so I think I, hopefully we're seeing movement in the right direction here, uh, where where companies are getting involved. Um, one case I think uh, business-wise, Red Hat's sale to IBM, I think it's pretty clear that the cloud use of Red Hat had diminished the value of the Red Hat subscription. I'm not sure how many Red Hat people here, but. Um, the Red Hat subscription was sort of this 
subscription, you get your updates and you get support and all that, right? But, but I think in a lot of ways, there was so much use of Red Hat in the cloud that people were getting their support maybe from the cloud vendor in Red Hat's business was sold to IBM, maybe because that was sort of declining. I'm not saying that's true. I saw one out, an analyst who indicated that, but I'm not going to go to the bank on it. Okay. Any questions? I know that was a lot. <laughs> no questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Just to simplify, Red Hat has acquired what the biggest uh, amount of money, but not in subscription, but in cloud and services like OpenShift. So oh, okay. they are turn around, but your impact is true. Yeah, the, the, the issue, is, it's down to this uh, second bullet here. It's down to the second bullet for Red Hat, okay? Um, the sense is that, Red, that the cloud vendor already has a relationship with the customer. And I'm sorry. Yeah, the cloud vendor already has a relationship with the customer. Do they bring Red Hat in on top of that or not? That's, the, that's what Red Hat has to do to, to maintain their, their high volume in the cloud. And that's hard. And that's some of the stuff I do cover in these, in these blog entries. Yeah, good, good point. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, great. Okay, so can, now, so we talked about the project challenges. Now we're going to talk about competitive challenges. All right. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of competitive challenges here, right? <laughs> we got a lot of databases. Uh, the whole database market has ballooned in the past five or seven years. There's so many new databases out there. In fact, there's almost too many. Uh, there's a sense that that in the I guess early 2010s. There was a huge amount of new work around databases. A whole bunch of things popped up. And over time, that's going to decline as there's consolidation. People don't want to have 20, 30 databases in their enterprise. Um, but you can basically see you now have new type, you have databases more segmented than they used to be in the past. I have a talk about this. Um, it's talked. It's it's basically called data horizons with Postgres, new data horizons, and what it basically says is that currently today we have so many different sources of data than we used to. Remember, we used to have people typing on terminals. I'm not sure how many of you go back that far, but you'd have the order department and they'd be typing on their terminals all day, right? And they'd be hardwired Ethernet to the server and everything was, you know, or, or serial. We used to do that, serial cables. Um, you now have GPS data, you have social networking data, you have full text search, you have documents, you have GPS tracking, Internet of Things. And you need sometimes different databases. And that's where I think a lot of the new innovation has come in. Now, Postgres has done a really good job of, I think, bringing in that new technology. I have a non-relational talk called Non-Relational Postgres on my website, again, one of the 58, um, that talks about how Postgres has sort of brought in non-relational data to the relational database. But what if one of these becomes the de facto standard for the enterprise. Like what if full text search, I, I'm, it might be silly, but what if every full text search becomes so important, it's the critical aspect of the enterprise and all the other stuff, the relational stuff just isn't as important anymore, right? Or what if columnar somehow becomes something, we have such huge data volumes with a lot of duplication and we just, I don't know. All I'm saying is if, if, other solutions become dominant, Postgres might not be able to adjust. We're so sort of, we, we've adjusted really well, as you can see over the 26 years that we're now innovative, but as a leader, I'm always looking to understand, are we able, are, are we addressing the market properly? And that's kind of that big question there, okay? Um, we have a lot of forks of Postgres. This is a great chart over here and URL there at the bottom. We have forks of Postgres for cloud. We have forks for horizontal scaling, data warehouse, you know, Yugabyte and um, Aurora. And I can't, even, what's the Google one called? I can't, I can't even remember. Alloy, Al yeah, Alloy, right. Yeah, it's kind of a cute name. So, 
again, we've got all these forks out there. Um, that's great. It's taking Postgres into new markets that the community can't go into or doesn't have an interest. Um, but, it, but that's kind of something we have to think about, right? We have to think about how are we working with these forks? Is there a market there that we're not addressing? Um, we don't want to be like the BSD case where it's split in the project itself split into a whole bunch of different directions in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where we now have three different BSDs instead of one. One focused on security, one focused on portability, one focused on desktop, right? Or you see, that's not where we want to go. A, a very cautionary case is EGCS. Anybody remember the EGCS compiler? Oh, I got a zero on that one. Okay. Um, so so um, back, I want to say, early 2000s, the G GCC, which is, everyone knows GCC, the compiler, probably, you probably all use that. Okay. So what happened was GCC was so conservative in improving the compiler that a separate team was developed called EGC, EGCS, okay, which effectively added optimizations to the GCC compiler. EGCS became so popular that GCC had to, had to abandon their source code and move to the EGCS source code, okay? What does that tell me? That tells me that the GCC people originally were not flexible enough and attentive enough to what users wanted. So if EGCS could create something that was better and they were too stubborn to change, the users were gonna change, right? And then eventually GCC realized that we cannot continue going like this Everyone is moving to EGCS. We have got to basically humble ourselves, except that we've made a mistake by being too conservative and not improving the compiler and basically move to the EGCS source code. So what, what you're actually using now as GCC is effectively EGCS, right? You can see how, you can see that leadership mistake there, right? So that's the type of thing you don't want. You don't want to make that mistake. Uh, decline of relational. Uh, this is a great. This is a great story. You know, uh, you know, I'm I'm like 60 years old, but you know, even for me, this is old, right? Um, so I guess I was nine years old when you know when he started this. It's kind of crazy, right? Um, but the weird thing about rela the relational systems is that they've always resisted challenges. And I mean, getting really back to the EGCS case, what has happened over the what? What are we like? Uh, Fifty-two years into uh, into the SQL language, what's basically happened is as new requirements came up for relational, whether it was XML or object or NoSQL, instead of just staying on the same course, relational systems have adapted. They took the best of object databases. They took the best of XML databases. I would say Postgres, in some ways, has, has taken the best of NoSQL databases, and they've merged them together into something that's more powerful than the alternatives. So is that gonna continue for another 50 years? I have no idea. It's potentially possible it wouldn't, but what's really interesting is that the ability to basically restructure, reanalyze, shift data and view it in different ways that relational gives us is some fundamental value that's just very hard for other systems to, to compete against. And if you can bring in 60, 70, 80% of the value of your competitors, your, that relational system is so valuable that effectively the package becomes much more valuable than, than an offshoot. Uh, but as a leader, it's something we have to think about. Any questions? I know that was a, that was a lot too. <laughs> Okay, let's just go through the technical challenges and I'm going to take some questions. Okay, um, what technical challenges do we have? Uh, I think this is a pretty clear one, right amplification. This, I think, term, originally I think it was uh, Uber who kind of got this on the map for us, uh, but we've been dealing with it pretty much since I started, the concept of how do you do MVCC, how do you handle multi-version, 
versions of a row and how do you clean them up efficiently. Uh, the good news is that every release of Postgres that I've been around has been improving it. We've improved the handling of vacuum, we've improved auto vacuum, we've improved how we store duplicates to the point where I don't even know if this is an issue anymore. Like every year I see a major improvement and I don't know if the problem that was reported five years ago is still a problem. All right. Uh, probably the most dramatic change I've seen is actually the, uh, the storage of duplicate index entries in Postgres 14 that really was a game changer to me in how we handle those cases. So I'd love to see some new numbers on exactly how bad this is. Um, but it's something we always keep an eye on because people do complain about it, particularly in very high write workloads. Um, so hot, basically updates can cause massive indexes, up, updates, uh, removal of dead rows, uh, full page images, freezing. Um, the question I have as a leader is, are we doing the right thing or we do, do, we need to, do we need to do something radical? Do we need to completely rip out something and redo? I don't know the answer. But I'm putting it up here because it's something I think we have a responsibility to our users to continue to keep an eye on. Okay. Um, TDE, cluster file system. This has been a demand for our users for a number of years. I've been working on it for probably three or four. Uh, we continue to <clears throat> get challenged in getting this into Postgres. I think we're going to make perhaps some improvement in 16. I don't know. Um, I, it's, it's, I, it's just something I keep an eye on. Um, I think there's a lot, a couple, there's a number of enterprises that absolutely need this feature. Yes, it's a limited usefulness, but it's still, they still need it. Horizontal scaling, I've been with that this for five years. Um, we have forks of Postgres that do horizontal scaling, like Greenplum and um, uh, a couple others, but can we do this in, in native Postgres? Does it have to be a fork? I would argue it does not have to be. We actually have a, a presentation here about how we're planning to do it. And the good news is that every year for the past five years, we've made small improvements to get closer to this goal. Partitioning, parallelism, foreign data wrappers, we get closer and closer to, to, uh, to doing that. And finally, obsolete tool chain. As you know, may know Postgres is written in C. So uh, what if C isn't valuable anymore? Uh, it's not what it used to be. There's not as many people who know it. It's an issue. Uh, we have libraries that may become obsolete. Uh, I think lib libxml was one that we've had trouble with. Uh, another one is the library used by PLV8 is a challenge because uh, Google keeps changing the way they package it. Um, and even testing frameworks, we continue to have to adjust to new build environments and so forth. Um, but again, it's something that we just have to keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, what if what if technology changes drastically? This is probably this is the last one. Yeah. Um, so obviously, we've been at this for a number of years. I, in my experience, there have been two major industry changes in the in for databases. One was the use of SSDs which dramatically changed how you do uh, the cost of random IO. And second is obviously virtual machines, containers in the cloud. The good news is that we had to make almost no changes for Postgres to be useful in these environments. <laughs> I mean, we look like geniuses, but we weren't. It's just the way we designed the system to be independent of the operating system. So when containers can came along, when cloud came along, we're like, Okay, just put it in a container and ship it. Um, when, when we got SSDs, the only thing we had to change, we had to allow random page cost per table space if you mixed SSDs and, and magnetic in the same server, right? Wasn't hard. So I, I don't know what technology stuff might be coming down the pike. The good news is we've been really good at adopting it. So um, I would love to take your questions for the remainder of my time. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of them. Yes, sir, please. First hand up. Me again. <laughs> um, like you said, uh, we have a lot of, of Postgres forks, but I use Postgres of a lot of years like you and no, not like you, <laughs> no contrary, but uh, a lot of these projects that is dead now. So I don't trust in that for production. 
But we have some projects like Cytus, for example, uh, that's growing. What do you think about it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I think one of the values the people see in Postgres now is that longevity. All right. You know, when you've been at this for 26 years or 36 years, depending on how we count it, um, the, the mindset of how people see Postgres now is different. When I started, you know, in 96 and even up until about 2010, people would see a move to Postgres as a move downward. If they had to port and rewrite their Oracle application to use the Postgres API, for example, it would be a cost, a negative, right? What's really weird now is when I talk to customers, EDB customers, for example, they'll basically say, you know, I don't really want the Oracle API anymore. I'm not going to be, I don't want to even think about going back there. I'd rather standardize on the Postgres API, right? So you're like, wow, that's really great. The person is actually standardizing on what we are now. And they don't care that they're leaving a proprietary database, right? That's a huge shift for me. And the reason they're willing to do that is because they see Postgres as a stable API into the future, an independent API into the future. The problem with the forks is that they don't, have, as you said, they don't have the longevity. It's very hard to retool around new APIs, right? So are, is a, if somebody's going to move to a fork, are they going to be sure that fork's going to be around long enough that it's worth the effort to test and move to that API? Are they going to look silly by doing it if next year it goes away, right? And I think that it, I could do a whole talk just on that because the real complexity is can you generate a critical mass I, you know, we had we had to generate a critical mass in 1996 to get Postgres with enough momentum to bring it to where it is today, right? So the question is, if for a fork, can they generate the critical momentum to get them to where they want to be in the future? For Citus, it's a little easier because they're sort of being promoted by Microsoft, and, and there's this, this symbiosis there. Um, but, but then, for example, if you go to a green plum, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of going in and out. They, they were not on the current version of Postgres. They're working up to the current version of Postgres. The Pivotal has moved into VMware and then out of VMware again, right? Um, so it's not a question of can you, it's not a question of can you service your current customers. The question is, can you continue attracting new customers and can you show a consistent progress? When I see projects like, like Interbase or Firebird where they had the problem with the password, right? Or, or somebody isn't released, somebody said, we're gonna release in J July and then a year goes by and there's no release, right? the whole confidence in that project goes goes down, right? So I think that's really the challenge. You know, you've got Postgres as a generic database, I would say. And and you're you're basically like, okay, um we've got people meeting uh the HA niche or the 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 the, the distributed niche, which would be Yugabyte, for example, or or the time scale, right? Doing the time series, right? And they've got the niches and we don't think we can stretch Postgres in that direction cleanly right? Um, to do that. Multi-master, right? Another one, I don't think we can stretch Postgres cleanly in that direction. We can do it for, I think, horizontal scaling. I don't think we, but is that something, is that really going to work? Or do we need, does the community need to stretch there? And that's really the question we're always trying to, to understand. We, we love the niche groups out there because they're meeting those needs. Um, how do we keep them healthy? How do we keep the code clean for them so they can be effective. Um, is that some, are we like EGCS though, where this is really where everyone go, wants to go and the community is stuck in doing something nobody wants anymore and we're eventually gonna have to give up and move to their code base, right? So you can see, that's why I said I could give a whole talk just on that question because 
there is so much to a project more than the technology in terms of how it's viewed and how it communicates to the larger market. Um, and I think that is a huge challenge because there are too many perhaps forks out there. Um, and you know you have to figure out you know where do you go with that? And we have too many relational databases that are just legacy now, right? Forget the new ones, you know, the almost you know, Informix I was talking about, Ingress, uh, Psybase, um, uh, you know, the, all those are kind of used to be big. So it's it's a tough call. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Dave. So I this on. So I've been in the community almost as long as you have, Bruce, yep. and, and um, the development process really hasn't changed that much. I mean, yeah. in, the, in the project, you used to mm -hmm. use mailing list, there's no bug tracker. Yep. Uh, and we've seen, and in, and in 1996, there wasn't really anything else besides mailing list. That's right. IRC or something. Um, clearly, the world has Absolutely. And, yep. and we have. Uh, do you have any opinion? I mean, I, so one, one thought I had is, in 10 years, do you really see it being the way it is now? <laughs> so, do you have any opinions on this? So, I think for me, that's a great, that's a great question. So, for me, the question is not. So, you're looking at a new way of doing something, a new process, whatever that is, right? Right, right. So, the question is, why would I want to? There's two really questions. Why would I want to go there, and why would I not want to go there? Right. I mean, that would be my sort of understanding. Right. So I think the most important part for us is always to be ready to talk about whatever idea somebody has. Right. Even if they want to suggest we paint it blue, we're going to talk about it. Right. And we're going to discuss it and we're not going to close people down and we're not going to say that's a bad idea without really discussing why or whatever. Right. The, the important part for this for this project is to be open and to be interested in new ideas. I think that you're absolutely right. Our process appears very old, very crufty, very hard for people to get involved. Um, I don't know, the, the, the cautionary tale I've always had with a bug tracker is how to manage it, who's going to do that, how are we gonna get our current volunteers to get excited about doing that. Um, the most recent discussion I had was with Robert Treat while I was in Los Angeles, and somebody from Fedora was talking about their bug tracker. And he was the manager of their bug tracker, and he's talking about how we manage the bugs and whatever. And I talked to Robert after. I said, what do you think? Is that something like we should be looking at? They lose Bugzilla, but whatever. And I said, you know, I said, the thing that really kind of got me is that Fedora releases every two years, and they basically end of life their, their old software. And he basically said, we just erase the bug tracker every two years. So everything that's over two years old just gets erased. And I, I was kind of horrified by that because I am often looking back at issues from that long ago. So um, I, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think there's a certain, there's a certain elegance to what we do that's not necessarily visible. And I think if you just, Bear with me. I think one of the interesting things, and we only have a couple more minutes, but um, what, because we do not have a bug tracker, what happens is that we're forced to deal with the issue when it appears. Because what I've seen in a lot of projects is the bug comes in, it sits in the bug tracker, and then like it just kind of like languishes out there, or it, it 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 morphs into something else, and then you have to merge it with this other thing. And um, I don't know, I don't know. I, I really, I almost don't want to have an opinion on it. I, I just, I would rather just continue discussing it and not come out and say I think it's this way or I think we're going to do that. Um, well, if you if you take a look at the number of bugs we have. You're talking about specific items. Hey, Dave, the microphone. Right. <laughs> You're sort of narrowing it down to specific challenges. I'm trying to look at the bigger picture. Right? We can't just talk about the bug tracker. We, the bug tracker may not be the answer. Oh, I see what you're saying. saying. I'm just saying that, you know, in some ways we're impeding 
people from coming in. And that's my bigger issue is that, you know, all these young people are used to using GitHub, they're used to using whatever. And now they have to bend to our way. Yeah. And that seems, you know, I, in some ways I see that as being an impediment to the project. Now, if you want to take aim at any specific one thing, like a bug tracker or like a mailing list, there's obviously issues with those. But, you know, we have to start, as a leader, I guess, uh, in, in the project, you have to start thinking bigger, more, uh, you know, bigger picture kind of view. Yeah, no, you're, I, I think you're right. I think particularly allowing Git pulls, which we don't really, you just ignore, right? right? Yeah. Is it's kind of bad, right? And yeah. well, you know, why can't we? Yeah, be a little more modern there. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think we have to be continually adjusting things. I and mean, I think we've gotten pretty good. We have the the commit fest app, and and I, I'm pretty happy with how that's going, how the submissions go. But we have to continue to be evolving. I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, um, oopsie. This, yeah. Yeah. So on on the subject of forks. Oh, um, oh, what? Forks. Forks, yeah. That you mentioned. I, I see there is an interesting kind of tension or compromise because between what some of these project cores are kind of requesting to be merged into Postgres core and what Postgres is deciding or not deciding to, to merge. For example, there was a recent uh, very, very interesting post about some security vulnerabilities that appeared on, on to Mayor Cloud in, or on their Postgres service. And it is technically not a Postgres vulnerability, but it's kind of a, and it was presented, I think it was a right angle, a limitation of Postgres in running on a multi-tenant environment, such as right. network. Right. And they proposed some patches to Postgres that improved their situation or helped their situation and right. they were not accepted. Right. Um, similarly, I was recently speaking with the Neon people and they are going to propose some patch to add CMIN and CMAX to be well locked. Okay. Which is a relevant technically for most people except those that are going to be making Postgres uh, where, where the storage and computer are separated. Okay. And I wonder also if this change, which benefits no one except those that are pursuing these goals, is, is going to be accepted. So at some point, there's going to be a tension between what Postgres core is accepting into and what is not, and whether this is going to cause some of these forks to try to somehow either work around it or at some point say, okay, you know what, we're going to do our own Postgres version. And, and so what do you think on this tension, how we can deal with it? Well, it's, we like to bring in things that are useful to people who are using generic Postgres. I don't think there's anyone can argue that there's something wrong about that. Um, I also don't think that I think it's completely legitimate to say that it's on that the responsibility is is on the 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 fork to provide whatever they want. Uh, what we do look for is things that are either beneficial to the fork and the community, or would be beneficial to multiple forks. So for me, if something's beneficial to multiple forks, even if it's not beneficial to Postgres, that kind of tips the the scale for me. Because now at least we're writing it once, right? And then all the forks can use the same thing. The security vulnerability that you talked about, particularly, I think that was actually handled well because I felt that what that was trying to do actually was not going to be real security. There was too many ways to bypass it. We wanted to do what he wanted. We wanted the goal that he wanted. Uh, I, we all wanted that. But if you read the thread, it was very clear that it was going to appear to do what he wanted, but was in no way going to accomplish it for anybody that was competent, a competent bad person, right? And I think that was what killed it. Um, but if he had been able to implement what he wanted, the community would have benefited too. It wouldn't even have been a fork issue. Uh, so we're trying to, we kind of slice these separately um, to look at exactly, you know, how, uh, which stuff we get in. But the multi-fork thing, I think, would be a, a good barrier. Um, in terms of security issue, uh, we have been kind of moving in that direction. There's a lot more granularity on permissions because a lot of the cloud vendors can't give uh, super user, but they can give these specific permissions. And I think that's a great direction that I, I think is part of the fork cloud story uh, that I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I don't know if I have a plan to another question or we're just going to, let's see here. No, I think we're, other question. No, okay. 
All right, I think I have one minute left. So, uh, oh no, sorry, yes, okay. You, we always can come to you for one minute question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you talk about, uh, I, I don't want to, to interrupt other people. Uh, you talk about uh, other uh, storage classes, or other storage types, like uh, I'm praying a lot for a Postgres to have a storage class in memory, for example. Right. Uh, how about that plans about that? Yeah, so we uh, we created a, a separate storage layer, um, like a like an API for storage engines. Uh, it was actually created as part of a of a of a feature we we're calling Z Store, um, but uh, unfortunately that didn't that hasn't kind of materialized. It was it was a way to reduce write amplification. Uh, what's it called Z Store, right? What's that called? Yeah. Zheap, thank you. Not, Z store is the columnar storage. Z heap is the multi write amplification one. I see a huge opportunity there. I think we're going to hopefully we'll see the cloud vendors move into that area. We're going to see columnar there. Hopefully, we can see something related to um, to this. Uh, Oriole DB is doing some unusual in, in things at that storage layer as well. I think Citus is also using that storage layer. So. I, I'm hoping that's going to be the new opportunity, I think, that's going to make it easier for the forks to continue using vanilla Postgres and put storage engines. That's something MySQL did years ago. Robert Haas kind of got on that bandwagon. I, I think it's like 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 JSONB. Like we did it like years ago and it took a while to kind of like mature into something everyone's using. And I think the same way the storage engine we did a couple of years ago, it's going to take a couple of years to kind of come to fruition and see what people... We had extendability for like 15 years until everyone started talking about it. And it just sat there. We had, no, I'm sorry, we had it for 25 years because it came from Berkeley, right? And it was a super headache until people started using it. So I'm hoping that's going to be the same story here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm super excited about this conference.